The first talk is on semi-axiomatic sequent calculus. And there are three authors, Henry de Jong, Frank Fenning, and Klaus Pixma. And we have two pre-recorded movies. You should see. Hi, I'm Henry de Jong and Klaus Pixma. And I will be presenting our paper with Frank Fenning on a semi-axiomatic sequent calculus. The celebrated Curry-Howard isomorphism, also sometimes known as propositions as types, demonstrates the close correspondence between logic and computation. Propositions become types, proofs become programs, and proof reductions become the basis for an operational semantics. As examples, there are correspondences between intuitionistic natural deduction and the simply typed lambda calculus, the intuitionistic Hilbert system, and combinatory reduction, and an intuitionistic sequent calculus with a stoop and explicit substitutions. All of these use the same underlying logic with the different computational models arising from different presentations of that same logic. In this talk, Klaus and I will describe a new presentation of the sequent calculus, which we call the semi-axiomatic sequent calculus, and its computational interpretation is shared memory concurrency. To start, I'll briefly review an intuitionistic sequent calculus, G3. Sequence have the form gamma term style A, where context gamma are sets of propositions A. We have the usual identity and cut rules, along with the usual right and left rules for implication. In the left rule, notice that the antecedent A implies B is carried over to the two premises. To keep things simple, I will divide the other logical connectives and their right and left rules. To ensure that the meanings of the logical connectives are given entirely by the right and left rules alone, we want to check that the cut rule is in fact admissible. In other words, we need to prove that if there exist cut-free proofs of gamma turnstile A and gamma A turnstile C, then there exists a cut-free proof of gamma turnstile C. One case in proving that theorem involves cut-free proofs that end with the implication right and left rules, respectively. To avoid clutter but maintain the essential ideas, I'll show only a special case in which the second proof's premises do not use the A implies B antecedent. Cutting these proofs together would yield a proof of gamma turnstile C. We can reduce this cut to two cuts that combine the various premises into a cut-free proof of gamma turnstile C. This principal cut reduction terminates because the two new cuts occur at smaller cut formulas. Our theorem then is that if there exist cut-free proofs of gamma turnstile A and gamma A turnstile C, then there exists a cut-free proof of gamma turnstile C. The semi-axiomatic sequent calculus starts with the same rules as G3, but replaces the implication left rule with an axiom, namely from antecedents A and A implies B, the consequent B can be established. The other rules remain unchanged. This change does not affect provability. The new axiom was already derivable in the original sequent calculus, G3, using the identity rule and the usual implication left rule. Conversely, the usual implication left rule 
is derivable in a semi-axiomatic sequent calculus by using cut and the new implication left axiom. Once again, we would like to check that the cut rule is admissible for this new semi-axiomatic sequent calculus. Unlike in G3, we won't be able to completely eliminate all cuts. For example, there is no cut-free proof of the sequence A implies B, B implies C, turnstile, A implies C. But all is not lost. Although this cut can't be eliminated, it is nevertheless a safe cut. It is analytic and respects the subformula property. In fact, this combination of cut with the implication left rule in the first premise corresponds to a cut-free instance of the regular implication left rule from G3. So for the semi-axiomatic sequence calculus, we won't be able to prove complete cut elimination per se, but we can prove a proof normalization result where these kind of cut plus implication left axiom combinations are taken as cut normal proofs. This will be different from cut elimination in G3 in the way that we structure the cut reductions. We will exploit the fact that this cut plus implication left axiom combination is not monolithic. So our theorem then is that if there exist cut normal proofs of gamma turnstile A and gamma A turnstile C, then there exists a cut normal proof of gamma turnstile C. The principal case for implication now happens when the right rule meets our new left implication axiom. We must find a cut normal proof of gamma A turnstile B. But that's easy, it's just the subderivation that we already have. Well, what happens when the implication left axiom occurs in the first premise of a cut? On the previous slide, we argued that such a cut is safe and should be treated as normal. So there is almost nothing to do. We just form that cut. We call it a left commutative cut reduction because it is very, very vaguely related to the kind of left commutative cuts that occur in G3. What happens then when this normal proof occurs in the second premise of a cut? In this case, we can reassociate the subderivations to form a cut normal proof. First, we cut gamma A turnstile A implies B against our new implication left axiom, appealing to the admissible cut principle to form a cut normal proof of gamma A turnstile B. This appeal is valid because we appeal to the principle at the same type, but smaller derivations. Then we cut this proof against gamma B turnstile C, appealing once more to the admissible cut principle to form a cut normal proof of gamma A turnstile C. The second appeal is valid because even though the first premise's proof may be larger, we are using a strictly smaller subformula. And this subformula arises as a strictly smaller cut formula, I'm sorry. And this formula arises as a strict subformula of the A implies B that appears in our new implication left axiom. To make all of the preceding ideas formal, we can introduce separate SNP rules. These SNPs are cuts that may safely remain in cut normal proofs. Variables and markings on those variables are used to ensure that these SNPs are indeed used in only safe ways.
I won't present these in detail, but you can find them described in our paper. I've presented the implication fragment only so far, but the underlying ideas behind the semi-axiomatic sequent calculus are very robust. In addition to implication, we can have all of the other usual intuitionistic propositions, such as conjunction. For instance, to derive the semi-axiomatic treatment of conjunction, we take its usual sequent calculus rules and replace the non-invertible rule, the right rule in this case, with an axiom. This pattern of replacing non-invertible rules with axioms holds for the other propositions as well. We can even construct semi-axiomatic sequent calculi for intuitionistic linear and ordered logics. And we conjecture that all intuitionistic sequent calculi have semi-axiomatic versions. Now I'll hand off to Klaus, who will describe the computational interpretation of the semi-axiomatic sequent calculus in terms of shared memory concurrency. Thank you. I am Klaus Brooksma, and I'll be giving this second half of this talk on the operational semantics that arise from the semi-axiomatic sequent calculus. So first, a brief overview of the structure of the talk. We'll begin by discussing how we get from our logic, as discussed in the part one of the talk, to the language. We'll go over the semantics, uh, focusing on some specific rules. And then we'll look at some examples that make use of those particular constructs. We'll give a bit of further context in the form of some details about how the programming language works, how programs actually execute. And then we will briefly discuss results and future and related work. So first, to get from the logic to the language, we modify our sequence by adding in this process term p. Um, and the key idea here is that the variables x1 through xn, as well as z, represent addresses in shared memory. And p, rather than ex an expression, is a process term. It's permitted to read from addresses on the left, the x1 through xn, which we might call sources. And it is required to write to the address on the right, the z of type c. And we will call that the destination. So our rules break down into a couple different cases. We have cut identity, right and left rules for different connectives. And so we have some principles for what each of these should look like. So cut operationally should allocate a new shared location or shared memory cell. And it will also spawn a new process which will write to that location because the memory cell is useless without something to fill it in. Identity will copy information from one cell to another. Write rules will write to memory in a very nice mnemonic fashion. And left rules, dually to the right rules, will read from memory. So first we'll look at cut. Um, a process running this cut, uh, this x left arrow p semicolon q, which should be read as something like spawn p and continue as q, will first allocate a new memory cell with a fresh address a. It'll spawn a new process executing p, which is going to write to a. Uh, and it will continue executing the process q, which is permitted to read from a, but again, is not required to. Now, two things arise from this. Um, the first one is maybe a little bit obvious, but it's important to note that reading from an address is a synchronization point. Uh, we can't read from the address or from the memory cell before it's been written to. So while we can run p and q in parallel, p does need to terminate before q can actually go and read from that cell. And second, and we'll see this a little bit more later on, a new memory location has only one writer p, um, but may be read multiple times in q. So in particular, we'll see that uh, writing to a cell is a terminal action for a process. So there's nothing that it can continue to do afterwards. It can't write it again. It can't read from further things, but reading is non-terminal. So uh, q may read from the cell and then do some other stuff and then read from the cell again. So now we move to look at identity. And here we introduce a bit of notation that's convenient throughout. We have these superscripts w and r to indicate when a variable is being written to or read from, respectively. So we can see here that y is being written to and x is being read from. And accordingly, this process will read the data at location x. 
and then write that data to location y. So it very much is a copy from x to y. Next, we'll look at the conjunction. Uh, and as in a functional language, this is the type of pairs. And here we have parenthesized both positive and eager because we also have a uh, negative conjunction which corresponds to lazy pairs that we're not going to get into detail about here, but that we'll briefly look at later. So as we might expect, uh, a process that uh, provides or writes to the destination z of type a and b writes a pair into that location. Uh, and here it writes the pair x, y. And x and y are these addresses that we're entitled to use on the left. Now, importantly, these are not a pair of terms. It's a pair of addresses. Um, you can think of this as, for instance, writing pointers into memory rather than writing the value stored at those pointers. Um, and in particular, because x and y are never read from in this rule, cells x and y may be empty. This gives us a, a good deal of parallelism. We can be running some process that's going to fill in x eventually, a process that's going to fill in y eventually, and this process. Um, and something else can go along about its business, read from the cell z, see that there are these cells x and y somewhere that will eventually contain an a and a b, and not need to read from them until later on. So dually to the right, we need to have a read, and we use this case construct to do that read. Um, and as one might expect, this reads a pair from address z, extracts the components as x and y in a form of pattern matching, and continues executing the process p, which may make reference to x and y, and may in fact read from them in the future. And also, z remains accessible to p. p may go and read from the cell z again, although it's redundant in this case. So now we move on to our next connective uh, implication. And here we'll first look at the reading rule because this is our, our other axiom. Um, so this process, the x superscript r dot brackets yz reads from memory. Um, it goes along with the left rule. So according to our operational principles, it should read. And well, we've labeled x with an r, so that should be another good indicator that it's reading. Um, but we need to think about what it's reading. So it's reading from x, uh, and x has type a implies b, so that we can think of that maybe as some sort of function. But then we have this pair y and z. Uh, y has type a, z has type b. y is on the left of the sequence, z is on the right. That's a little bit strange, so we'll think about how that's involved. So looking at it here, well, if x is a function, then y of type a, that looks a lot like an argument to the function. And the big difference here from lots of other systems is that we have this z of type b, that's the destination for the result. So just like in continuation passing style, we might pass a function, both its argument and a continuation to apply to the, uh, the final result. Here we pass in the argument and the destination where the final result should be stored. So running this process will read the function out of memory from location x, pass it the argument y, uh, execute the function at, at x with argument y, and then store the result of that execution at z. And we can see over here the, uh, the dual construct that writes that into memory. Um, here we use the same kind of case construct that we saw before in the uh, case of reading for conjunction. But here we have the variable annotated with a w rather than an r. And the thing that this writes into memory is uh, a form of closure. This brackets yz goes to p. Uh, and this keeps track both of the input channel or input address y and the output address z. And this process doesn't do anything particularly complicated. It just takes that whole continuation, that whole closure, and writes it into memory in the same way that a functional language can store a function value in memory. So now let's look at a couple of examples of how we can use this. So first we have a simple composition function uh, that takes in f and g and returns their composite. Or you can think of it as reads f and g out of memory and writes a composite function into memory. And we see that actually the first thing that it does is it, it writes this closure into memory that takes in arguments a and c, uh, and then continues to do something. So once we've gotten our a and our c, that's a destination for the final result, 
we create a new location B, suggestively named to say that it should have type big B. Um, and then we read the function f out of memory, pass it the argument A and the destination B, so that we'll run f on A and store the result in B. And in parallel with that, we read the function g out of memory, pass it the argument B and the destination C. So we'll run f in parallel with g. Eventually, g will need to read from B, and then it'll block until f finishes writing to B. And then g will go on to terminate and write to C. We've got a couple of other examples here uh, that I don't want to go into detail for time reasons, but you can look back at the slides later if you're interested or go to the paper. So we have a simple currying function that shows off both implication and uh, conjunction, and it's opposite the uncurrying function. So now we'll look a bit at the details of how the language works, some of the technicalities. Um, so we work throughout with values and continuations. Uh, as we saw earlier on, we have uh, this pair of addresses, x, y, that we wrote into memory uh, with pairs with conjunction. And in the case of implication, we wrote this closure or continuation, uh, brackets z comma w goes to p into memory. So memory can contain either values or continuations. Uh, and similarly, as we saw, Moving back to here, uh, when we read from memory, here we provide a value when we're reading. We read a continuation out of memory, and we provide it with a value. Going back even further, here we read a value out of memory and provide it with a continuation. So all of our actual read steps where computation happens involve matching a continuation with a value. and I've written down here what uh, the particular case of eager pairs and functions use for their value continuation matching, where uh, if we match the pair x, y with the continuation z, w goes to p, well, we continue with p, but substitute x and y for z and w. Now, I've mentioned a little bit that we have types other than the two that we discussed here. And so here's a brief description of them. We have a unit type one, we have a type a, uh, with B of lazy pairs, um, and we have a type A or B of labeled sums. Uh, and you can see if you look at the paper, just like positive conjunction and implication share values and continuations in a form of duality, so do uh, with and or uh, lazy pairs and labeled sums. And I'll also note that in the paper we use tensor rather than wedge for positive conjunction. Um, this doesn't make much of a difference though. So then, briefly, we should think about what a running computation looks like, uh, because we've talked a lot about how things compute intuitively, but not much about the details. Um, and we've talked about memory cells, running processes, all of this sort of informally. Uh, formally, a running computation is made up of semantic objects that are representing memory cells and running threads, as we would expect. Um, it has a couple of invariants. So first, each thread has an associated empty cell that it eventually will write to. and uh, it'll fill in that cell, and a filled in cell has no associated process because the process is already terminated by writing. And also we have unique addresses for every cell. Um, so then, given that we can have some results, um, we have standard variants of progress and preservation, which say the usual sorts of things, progress, we can always take a step, or we're in some sort of final state where every memory cell has already been written to. Preservation, our configuration of memory cells and running threads always maintains the same typing. Uh, we have confluence because our semantics are non-deterministic, as is unsurprising in a parallel setting. We don't enforce an order of which process runs when. Um, and we also have termination, which again should be somewhat unsurprising because we don't have recursion. So it's fairly easy to see why that might hold. So now we'll look briefly at future and related work. There's uh, a variety of prior work on destination passing style, and I've given a couple of references here. Um, these are related and are definitely a strong influence on some of the ideas that we have in this paper. Uh, we don't believe that there's anything that's strongly similar to the, the logical background for it that we have here. And then for some future work, we'd like to extend SACS to other logics. We're currently working on extending it to adjoint logic, but it also has been shown to extend nicely to, for instance, linear logic. And 
we'd also like to add recursion to a sax based language to get more expressive power. And that's all I have. Thank you for listening, and I'll turn it over to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we now have some time for questions. I, I wonder if there is any hand raising. So far, there is none. Uh, class, you are here, right? Yes. Um, yeah. So I see there's so maybe, a question. Maybe I start with a silly question. Oh, uh, I think there's a question is, already. Um, if you look at the Q&A interface. Uh, how, how can I see the question? I can see the list of participants. You mean, but, oh, ah, it's here. Yes. Uh, what happens to the semantics if you transform all the rules, not only non-axiomatic ones, to axioms? Uh, I'm not really sure how to answer this question. Uh, we haven't looked at transforming all of the rules to axioms, um, in part because the in part because the motivation for this was to find a way to give a logical background for a shared memory semantics. Um, it's something that I'd be interested to look at, but uh, I'm not sure what it would look like right now. Now you see that there is a uh, supplement to this question, right? Not only non-invertible yes. ones, I mean, yeah. So is that what you wanted to know, Yanni? No, no for no no comment. Ah, thank you. So it means probably it's answering. Any other any other uh, question? You can also uh, uh, ask a question by raising hand. By raising hand, and I should see it. Well, I'll have a, uh, uh, and I should see it in on the list of party. Oh yeah, there is Frank. Hi Frank. Hello Frank to talk. Frank? Yes, I just wanted to add to, to um, so that in the extreme, if you have as many axioms as possible, I think you get Hilbert's calculus, where you have at least one inference rule of modus ponens. I think you can't get away without having any inference rules. In that case, you get uh, combinatorial logic and combinatorial reduction, which is not really what we're aiming for here. Um, at least that's uh, at a high level, that's the way I understand the landscape. I see. Uh, any further questions? Well, I wanted uh, maybe to ask a silly question. If there is a, a natural deduction a, a counterpart to this kind of sequent calculus study, is there any way of expressing this phenomena using natural deduction? No response? And, um, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like. Uh, that's why I'm uh, asking. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I will note is that uh, we've been looking at how to translate a functional language into this language in a, a coherent way. Um, so that doesn't exactly answer your question, but. Um, but it's close. It's close. Yeah. So we don't have a paper on this or anything. Uh, it's still work in progress, but it looks like we should be able to take a standard functional language with all of its usual constructs and. Uh, translate them into not quite the semantics given in this paper, but a slight variant on them that uh, that sequentializes it, because otherwise we run into some difficulties with uh, the parallel language can simulate the sequential one, but not vice versa. Um, and so we need to have a sequential version in order to get a, a proper bisimulation. And uh, of course, there may be ways of uh, adding in concurrency there. We'll need to investigate further. Thank you.